Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Patreon exclusive episode hashtag number sign, if you will, one pop culture Pete with Pete. That's you. No, it's not me, but that's fine. I've 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 given up fighting it, so I'll just I'll just embrace it. Yeah, so uh this is another podcast that Dom Greeny pitched in his grand uh you know like uh, what I describe as a pitch to network executives about upcoming sitcoms. And uh, this was on his list that he pitched to me uh, to bring to the Patreon. And uh, it goes like this. Pop culture Pete. While he puts on a tough exterior, both in the squared circle and on the podcast, the Duke is actually a nerd like everyone. Hear about his trips to Comic-Con and other things he enjoys within pop culture because he has that duke money well comic-con is it would be an interesting one and that's not one that popped into my head for episode one we'll definitely have to go back to that uh so what we kind of decided on which was going to shock people uh for episode one of pop culture pete is we are going to discuss hip-hop music specifically old school hip-hop specifically old school hip-hop because for those of you that know me at all, you know that I love me some old school hip hop. And for those of you that don't, it would probably shock you to know that I am in what they call an aficionado of, uh, of an old, old school hip hop. Yes, I'm an old head. It, I mean, to be honest, how many of these people actually know you on a personal level? Well, I, you know, I mean, I'm sure if they've heard any kind of stories or if there's actually people that know me that listen to this thing. I mean, I I don't know. I don't know what your listenership is. I, I don't know. I have anything. I'm just we're trying to build it up. With I show up and do my job as you know, just like at the shows. You want me to come in and talk about some stuff here? I am talking about some stuff. Yeah. So this is uh, this is something that, uh, you know, all of us that do know you on a personal level know that you are a fan of so many different things. That's very true. That's very true. And this is one of them. And uh, it probably goes back to, oh, man, probably 1980. Let's see. I was in eighth eighth grade, so probably 85, I think it was, 84, 85, with the, the advent, the discovery, if you will, of uh, a radio station uh, that it was an old 107.9. I believe that's the urban station again. Yeah. Well, back in the day, it was 107.9. They called it 108, and they used to do this thing called 108 Club Style every Sunday night, and they would play three, four hours of straight music, and they just have a DJ mixing up the songs and everything else. And I just remember listening to that at night, doing homework or something like that. And I would go to school the next day and talk about, you know, did you hear that Curtis Blow song? Or did you hear, you know, Fat Boys or whatever it was? And me and my friends and I would talk about it. And we started to get more people into it. And that's kind of what got me going on the whole thing. So when you say DJ, do you mean like an old school, like scratching DJ that was mixing records in? There was no scratching, but he would he would mix in. It was you know it was twelve inch mixes, and and then he would he would mix in songs back and forth. There would be no uh, no commercials and just and no music. yeah. And all they would do, all they would do periodically is they would just come in and they go one oh eight club style, and so, then they would play another twenty minutes. And so essentially, yeah, son, where'd you get this? So essentially, just like going to a club these days where it's just yeah it's not music right right uh so uh this may come out of nowhere but like for the time period it like it strikes me as that would be something that was kind of hard to find uh as far as you know hip-hop music because it's brand new it was i mean that's why i said it was like a it was like a thing that i don't know if it was me that first heard it or one of my friends and we were just like oh i heard this thing on the radio the night you gotta check this out and so we just started listening to it. And like I said, you would hear uh, Curtis Blow. You'd hear LL Cool J. You'd hear Run DMC. You'd hear uh, Grandmaster Flash. You'd hear um, UTFO, You know, whatever, whoever it was, whoever was popular at the time. And they would just play them all together. And then 
all of our friends, we played basketball. We were on the basketball team in like eighth grade. So uh, my one, I would bring my boom box and my one friend made a tape and we do, we do layup lines to Curtis blows basketball during game before games and stuff. Any break dancing going down? No, uh, I actually, I had a friend, I had a friend who was amazing. Uh, his name six step. He's actually still a friend of mine, but uh, he did you guys use the cardboard box? No, he would do it straight. We would do it at uh, school dances that were called canteens for oh, some yeah. reason. Canteen. They were they were still called canteens. Yeah, I'm, I'm I, was, not, I don't know why they were called canteens, I was, but I, they were. I always wondered that in, eighth, in seventh and eighth grade, it would be the canteens. They wouldn't call them dances. Yeah, and so we we'd always have that that stretch where they would give us some some run dmc or some fat boys or whatever else and this one kid man he was a machine he could do the head spins the the tornadoes he could do he could the back spins he could do it all he would do it straight on the on the tile so how so how does this kind of uh thing that you discover on a sunday sunday night how does this develop into becoming the aficionado that you are because it was it was just it was everything about it was awesome like everybody that came out had a hook it was you know Curtis Blow was just this gritty uh you know st- rapping about New York whatever else and then you had LL Cool J who was you know my radio i like it loud i'm the man with the box that can rock the crowd more in your face kind yeah, of yeah but just just a little lighter and then you had the fat boys that were just fun and they had the humid beatbox and all that stuff. And UTFO, where they had the three guys that would rap with each other, or Rockmaster Scott and the Dynamic Three, or you know s- stuff like that. That was just they would tell stories. Then they would tell stories over songs. Like the best example is uh, UTFO had a song called Roxanne, Roxanne, and it was the three of them were rapping about trying to pick this girl up. That was the whole song. But they were just really cool, innovative verses that they cut. Then she suddenly there was this girl. Roxanne Chante, she put out a song dissing the three of them back and called Roxanne's Revenge, and they would go back and forth. And that happened a lot back then is they would carry these... It was like storylines. Yeah, they would carry like feuds almost through songs. And, you know, it wasn't super political stuff yet. You know, there was a little bit of that with Grandmaster Flash or or Africa Bambata. Public Enemy, I hadn't... I don't know if they were around yet, but I hadn't found them yet. Okay. Um, they were like eighty seven started. Yeah, out. for me it was just it was just the it was just the the house party, lighthearted uh, stuff like that with a great beat, and you could learn the raps and you could you know you rap along and stuff like that and it was just it, it was it was just really really fun to do and you could talk about your friends and you get and it was good to like I said you could play basketball to it you could do other you know you could do things to it have it on the background whatever else and it was just it was it was awesome so. You know? What do you, so what are you doing? Are you buying like cassette tapes? Or are you taping on the radio? Like uh, you're trying to tape on the radio, but I'm buying cassette tapes. I had King of Rock. It was one of the greatest albums. No other. What kind of music you like? One of the greatest albums of all time. Run DMC, King of Rock. Um, I had a lot of back then. You had the singles where you know they put out the one song or right. the two songs. Or so you'd have like the UTFO songs, or I had uh, Fat Boys. Actually, records back then too, LPs. Um, so yeah, you, you, whatever you get your hands on, you know, like a vinyl record. Yeah. Did oh you yeah. Just like pretend you're a DJ and scratch them. Uh, not at that point, but I will get to that. Eventually, <laughs> so so uh, you know, it, were these things hard to find? Because even you know, in my youth, in the mid '90s, it was like uh, hip hop music and rap music was still kind of like shunned a little bit, so to speak. So was it even more difficult to get your hands on this stuff in the '80s? It wasn't. It wasn't as difficult as you think because it was all. It was just a new type of music. Like I said, it didn't have. Didn't have like any sort of like judgment or anything. No, it didn't have it didn't have the the political stuff to it. It didn't have so people wouldn't say, Oh, that's you know, don't listen to that, that's this, that, or whatever thing. It's just not as much cussing. Well, not even that. It was just it wasn't angry, it wasn't you know, it was just fun. Maybe you know, it was, maybe it was different because, you know, when I'm at 
teenager, that's when like the gangster rap stuff hit. That's really what I'm hard. saying. It, that, that didn't happen. You had, and then you know, and they kind of had they had the 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 records, they had the the music. You had the Fat Boys doing the tie-ins with, you know, the Beach Boys and 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 uh, Chubby Checker. You had the not necessarily the break-in movies or whatever, but they had Crush Groove, the movie with Curtis Blow and LL Cool J and Fat Boys and Sheila E. And, you know, they were trying to get their hands into everything they could and get everything out there, and I just ate it all up. So Break-In, that, that was a movie just about breakdancing, right? Yeah. And Break-In 2 was Electric Boogaloo? Am I right yeah, on that? it was the yeah, Electric yeah. Boogaloo. But Crush Groove... <laughs> Crush Groove was is a better movie than those two, and that has, that's um, like I said, that's LL, Run DMC, Curtis Blow, Fat Boys, and it's about this guy trying to get this record label off the ground called Crush Groove Records, and he's trying to have this concert with all these famous names in it. That was that was the first um, the first appearance basically of LL Cool J. And he was like 15 years old. I've never heard of that movie in my life. I'm, ever. I don't. I don't doubt that for a second. It was the same era as uh, the great Motown film, uh, The Last Dragon. Yeah, Crush Groove was 85. Yeah, I, believe. I think Last Dragon. Yeah, it was 85, 86, somewhere yeah. there. Great yeah. film. 80. Last Dragon is with uh, Show Enough, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I know The Last Dragon. I own it. I'd never heard of Crush. No, Groove. Crush but... Groove is if you like if you like old school hip hop, you have to see it because it's got. Fat Boys do a couple songs in it. Other uh, Sheila E, who's a not hip hop star, but amazing, she does glamorous life in it. I believe um, it's yeah, it's just it's really it's really interesting. The the only you know my only exposure to the Fat Boys is they did a song on the Nightmare on Elm Street Four soundtrack uh, in which they filmed a music video, and this is you know the height of MTV music videos. And they actually had a, a music video that like Freddy Krueger stars in, and uh, you know I've seen that like numerous, numerous times. But I know nothing else <laughs> really about the Fat Boys other than that. Well, the Fat Boys have probably put out three, four albums. They did one or two movies. Yeah, Disorderlies was the one I can remember, and they did Crush Groove. So yeah, but it was uh, one. I think only one of them still alive. It was Prince Marky D, Cool Rock Ski, and the Human Beatbox completes the three. Not to rap or steal their lines, but that's how they used to introduce themselves. Uh, Prince Marky D, I believe, is the lighter skinned, like Samoan looking one, and he's still alive. I think the other the other two were just really really fat, and I think they had health problems. <laughs> but um, it's funny you say that because you have you ever heard the DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince? Yes, yes, Nightmare, Nightmare in, in My Street. Okay. Yes, right. yes, right. yes, yes. I heard okay. that. So, uh, are you, do you become a fan of you know DJ Jazzy Jeff, Fresh Prince, or eventually? Yeah, I mean, at this point, at this point, we're in. You know, I'm in. I graduate high school, and I still have all the love in the world for all these guys, and then more people start getting <clears throat> on the scene, and. Uh, I go to um, John Carroll uh, my freshman year of college. I went to John Carroll for a year, and I lived in our dorm. We had three people in a room, and next to me were these three guys. One of them was a real straight, straight laced, uh, you know, by the book kind of guy. One was an Indian guy named Satish, who I think was high twenty four seven, and also there was a guy named Ken. He had a red hair, pencil thin mustache, um uh wore like chess king, you know, weird jeans and these puffy shirts and uh loved loved to date uh out anything but white women. Um he was just he was just he was a weird dude. And one day he comes to us and he goes, Hey do you guys want to go to a concert at the Masonic Temple where you know ECW used to run and all that stuff. Oh wow. And I'm like, well, who's playing? And he goes, well, it's third base, Queen Latifah, and Digital Underground. And I was like, yes, I'm in. And I had just discovered Digital Underground a few months before that. I saw their video for Do What You Like, and I saw it, and I was like, these guys are going to be huge because it was amazing. Explain, you know, so who's the headliner there, third base? Uh, do uh, Digital Underground went on last. Oh, so they're the headliner. Yeah. So I believe it was Latifa was first, who is amazing and great, uh, and then third base with at that point it was they hadn't put out 
the um, I can't think of the album, but they hadn't put out the album that has Pop Goes the Weasel on it. If this was the Gas Face. That was their big song. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that song, but that was basically a, a diss track, okay. if you will. And that was their big song. And then, of course, Digital Underground by that time was Do What You Like, Humpty Dance, you know, all that all and that I stuff. I mean, they they blow up. Uh, before you get more into this concert... Tupac was in that uh, group for a minute, wasn't he? Yeah. He, he wasn't in the group. He was, he was like, like a he was, he, he was with them for a couple songs. He did same song, I uh, I Get Around. He, he, tore, he toured with them. And Kiss You Back. Yeah, he he was like a featured artist or whatever. Yeah, he like was like a background dancer like and did, did backup vocals. So you may have seen Tupac at that during I that. I might day. have. Uh, so I did a little research on the Fat Boys. Uh on December 10th, 1995, Buff Love died of a heart attack in Queens, New York at the age of 28. Uh, he weighed 450 pounds at the time. Buff Love must have been the human beatbox. Uh, Prince Marquis D. Prince Marky D. Uh, is a current radio host right. of 99 Jams in Miami, Florida. And Cool Roxky resides currently oh. in New York. He's still uh, alive. You're feeding lies. Two out of three. Wow. Eight, in, still alive. In August of 2012, the remaining members of the Fat Boys were scheduled to perform at the 13th annual Gathering of the Juggalos, uh, but ultimately did not appear. Smart move. In 2015, the Fat Boys relaunched their clothing line, FatBoysClothing.com. And uh, in August tw- of 2017, their current manager, Uncle Louie, Discuss their current their commercial success with Rolling Stone magazine, uh, and that's really it. It looks like they have not put out no a full album since 1987. No, but they had the uh, so I knew the I knew the I knew the for sure that the Human Beatbox had died. I, I thought the other one did too, but I guess not. Um, so sorry, sorry I I killed you, but welcome back. Um, so now we back to this concert with Digital Underground. Yeah, so I mean, the concert was great. They only did about it was a typical multi-person show. They did like three songs, you know, a piece, like Latifah did uh, "Ladies First and uh, maybe "Unity," and I forget what else. Uh, and then Third Base came out, and did their two or three, and then well, Underground. So Third Base, they're the pop goes the weasel guys, right? Yeah. That was like their, they were uh, like one hit wonders. Yeah. MC Search and Prime Minister Pete Nice. Henry Rollins was in that video, wasn't he? Gas Face? Uh, or no, Pop Goes uh, the Weasel? I think the Pop Goes the Weasel. Uh, he might have been. Because that, that was, the one where that they was early like 90s. The fake like vanilla ice or whatever? No, that's, that's, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pop Goes the Weasel. Yeah, like they beat, yeah, I think, yeah, he like beats yeah. up like the vanilla Gas ice. Face, they beat up uh, a hammer with uh, weird glasses on it because they don't like MC Hammer either. Were you a big uh, iced tea guy in the uh, early no tea? no really? I I yeah. no I wasn't I didn't I didn't he I was feel like he was kind of like the transition between like sort of like that sort of like fun era I am like, not I am not a uh, hardcore rap guy like I'm not huge into that uh, so an ice that was iced tea back in the day and so I I guess maybe now I do like Public Enemy but I never really got into NWA or uh, iced tea or I can't think of anybody else off the top of my head that would fit into that category. Where are you at on uh, Ice T's Twitter these days? <laughs> oh, he's a disaster. He's amazing. <laughs> he is a freaking disaster. We need to run that boy 2020. <laughs> but so anyway, so I go through my first year of college. I transfer to Miami, and I have a friend who says to me, hey, how would you like to do a radio show? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, well, oh my they got- god, we're getting into some deep, deep cut facts. They on go, Pete. they go, we got, we got, they have a student, ra- student run radio station. It was alternative music back in the day, but he's like, but they'll let us do any kind of show we want. So we had uh, the first, we did it. I said absolutely. So we go to the meeting. There's like literally 15 people in this meeting because it, they just started the club or whatever you call it. And the radio station was tucked away in this little dorm way on, on the outskirts of campus. Actually, it was by me because I they stuck me out there, too. Um, but so we, we go Wednesday night at 8 o'clock is our show. And you can barely get the radio station on the radio because it's like some really low AM frequency. Like a low frequency, yeah. But 
it's the it's the soundtrack of the community channel in the uh for the like the local cable system with like the community announcements and this yeah so they would run just like you know come to the spaghetti dinner hey you know the trash pickup is this day or whatever and we were the soundtrack for that it was cable channel 14 i remember that 5 40 a.m cable channel 14 so we did we did the show for a year and then we were actually really really popular (laughs) for some reason and I guess maybe because we were just different from everybody else's and playing regular, like f- playing like Morrissey fun, and, fun and music and stuff. And yeah, we were just we were playing because they, they, we rated we would to bring our stuff. We would bring our CDs like we have like some Bell Biv DeVoe or some Run DMC or some Digital Underground or whatever. And then we rated their LPs and we found like 12 inch dance mixes of of these random songs. We found old Sir Mix-A-Lot uh, album, My Hoopty, you know, and all this all this other stuff. And so we we had a ball just doing whatever we wanted, playing music because nobody was listening. So we just did whatever we wanted. Did you have a fun DJ name? Uh, no, it was just it was we were Rhymes Du Jour. That was the name of our okay. show, and it was with Duke and Brad. And uh, and when we went through the first year, then we got to the second year, and they put us on the coveted uh, Friday afternoon lineup at four o'clock. Oh, which that's got to be a hot time for a college. Kid. It was. It was actually a really hot time because that's when everybody started getting drunk. And uh, it was actually the one of the best time slots they had, and they were like, "You guys want it?" We're like, "Yeah, sure." Because so. I, I, I guess it's kind of hard, maybe, for some people to understand, you know, how things were then to where it's like it was the radio or nothing as far oh, yeah. as music, pretty, pretty much. <clears throat> yeah, right. I mean, this was ninety two, ninety three. So, you know, we CDs had been were like three years old, right. I think, and uh, so we would just bring all our stuff in, and that's to your point earlier about. Uh, uh, doing the scratches or whatever. Whenever we would play music, like we we had explicit stuff. So oh, like man. my Snoop Dogg CD was the doggy style was the explicit, not the yeah, radio like, edit, like, like but, the one you got in the store. Right, right. So it's got all the f mother effers and all you know, all our motherfuckers. I guess I can swear. So yeah, all that stuff. So we would put a, uh, a an old record. No matter what, we just pull a record out of the out of the bin and lay it on the turntable and turn the turntable up and we would just edit the music ourselves. We would just scratch over all the swear words ourselves <laughs> so we could play the music So because we didn't care. Um, but, uh, yeah, so then... Um, so you really kind of had to be on your game because there's probably... Uh, well, we as, didn't, we, as we didn't you do it with songs we didn't know. We made sure we, we knew all the words. That's what so I'm saying. We, but, yeah. like, as, as you start entering the 90s, the... Uh, I think the content of hip hop music starts to change from fun party music to it gets a little bit more aggressive. Yeah, 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 yeah. And well, yeah, I mean, obviously, with <clears throat> when you have, I mean, Digital Underground changed, you have like the Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre and uh yeah and i just looked Snoop- mc hammer even tried to pivot a little bit which i actually like i actually like that, Was that stuff. please don't hurt him hammer yeah or whatever. I, I actually i actually yeah. when mc mc hammer went gangster i actually yeah, he, enjoy that he, when which i was shocked he didn't get a lot more praise when because i don't know if a lot of people even know this but mc hammer went to death row records like that's where his like he was on death row that's where his gangster rap album came from and like his new image that's... he was a guy that went to death row records well, he tried. He tried everything. I mean, he tried the. He was what the Oakland A's ball boy, and that's how. Uh, that's what he was when he was a kid. Then he was a dancer. Then he did turn this mother out, which is one of the greatest rap songs of all time. Uh, his first hit, and then he, he was the dance. You know, the parachute pants and dancing all the time. Then he did the. I think was the re- the religious one was before the. Was it before or after the gangster one? It had to have been after. Because he did the the hard the hardcore and then he did You've Got to Pray and all this <laughs> stuff. Yeah, he was like MC Jesus after that. Please Hammer Don't Hurt Him came out in nineteen ninety. Um so I'm looking too legit. Please to quit. Hammer Don't Hurt Him was his regular his regular. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm just going through yeah. Too Legit to Quit ninety one. I'm trying to look and see where the one you want has pumps and a bump on it, and uh that's the more heavy uh, right, hardcore. New anyway. venture with Oaktown Records, ninety two, ninety three. Oaktown three five seven, one of the greatest women's rap groups ever. Uh, the Funky Headhunter, Prime Time, ninety four. Funky Headhunter is, I think, might be it. Uh, yeah, Pumps in the Bump, Funky Headhunter, it's yeah. all good. 
Oh, It's All Good is a great song. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. I actually, I remember reading an interview with uh, Rick James, and he was talking about, like, they were asking about, like, his influence on, like, hip-hop and funk music and this and that. And he said he fucking hated it for a while. And, like, he, like, fucking, like, wasn't letting people sample his shit until, like, basically Hammer came to him. It was like, I don't want fucking my music used to call somebody's mama a bitch and this and that. My mom's not no bitch. Like, da 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 And Hammer's like, no, it's all clean. And, like, Rick James was like, all right, cool. Which, knowing Rick James, like, him getting on any kind of high horse. Well, yeah. Yeah. Death Row Records uh, was until... He, didn't, he doesn't make the jump to Death Row Records until 1995-96. Uh, it says in 95, Hammer released Straight to My Feet with Dion Sanders uh, from the Street Fighter soundtrack. And then uh, it says... Uh, was that before or after the Adams Family uh, soundtrack he did? I, uh, I think it's it's got to be after that. Uh, it says uh, his relationship with Suge Knight dates back to 1988. Yeah, I believe uh, that. He signed with Death Row Records in 95. Uh, and they would release the album titled Too Tight, which I don't see. Uh, I can honestly- his most his most notable song was a Too Late Playa with Big Daddy Kane and Danny Boy. Um, I can honestly say I've never heard any of the songs off that album, but I did just get mildly excited when you mentioned Big Daddy Kane because he is awesome as well. It says uh, after the death of Tupac Shakur, he he left Death Row Records. Uh, and then Family Affair I, is his next project, 96, 98, it says. Um, and I think that's probably... And then I think the Behind the Music VH1 when he went bankrupt was 99, probably. Hammer turned uh, to a gospel-friendly audience in, in 1998 with Family Affair. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we just went off on a on a little tangent there. But yeah. Big Daddy Kane, a.k.a. Glenn Jacobs, in between uh, gimmicks. Oh, maybe. I mean, Big Daddy Kane had some some bangers back in the day. Him and Kumo D. Right before uh, he became a dentist, right? Two other guys, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you went to dentist world somewhere in there. Yeah. So um, the, you, become a, you become a DJ scratcher. When do you, I, I guess, do you ever evolve outside of like everyone hits that point when they're listening to music to where it's like you're listening to everything new and then you just stop and you're just listening to what you listen to and that's it like when do you stop the evolution of your hip hop fandom the it's the fandom is still there the hip hop music for the last 20 years is just is just terrible well that's what that's what i mean i mean it's 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 like i could not tell you one Little Wayne song, uh, Two Chains, Little John. You know, I know the Little John song because I heard it on the see it on the radio or hear it on the radio sometimes. I just I don't listen to it at all because it's just it's awful. It is it's Duck if you buck. It's it's unlistenable. It that it doesn't it doesn't have any kind of a message. It doesn't have any kind of uh, the beats aren't aren't really that great. It's just it's just missing the. I don't even know how to explain it. It's just missing that. It doesn't have that it factor. So I guess as we wind down the first episode of Pop Culture Pete, uh, I guess give me you know your most influential uh, f- slash favorite old school hip hop artist, and then also g- give me uh, a couple of your favorite songs. For you know, some people might not even be aware of you know some of this stuff. Give me your give me your deep oh, wow. give me your deep cuts. All right. Well, I, first, the, the greatest greatest rap group of all time is Digital Underground, hands down. It's not even up for debate. Do, uh, did so? Did seeing them live change your opinion on that? No, seeing them live was just icing on the cake. I've got it like solidified three it for or four you? of their albums. They're, they're all their songs are amazing. Um, I know worldwide mentioned Tupac before. That's one of my favorite rap songs of all time. Is a song called Same Song uh, that. It was on an EP that they did. It's also in one of the worst movies ever made. Nothing but trouble, right? Yes, they they uh, did they did that song for the soundtrack. Yes, and they appear in it in in the yeah yeah. I, I think that's that might be Tupac's first appearance in a film. That movie in like is a court scene or unwatchable. something. Watchable. It is yeah. so bad, and uh, and uh, but the song is amazing. Uh, I'm trying to think of other songs that I I'm trying to think of songs that I just pop when they, when I they come on my the back, backspin on Sirius. Uh, uh, I go to work by Big Daddy Kane is a, is a great song. Um, uh, there's a song called Beats and Rhymes by UTFO 
that is amazing. Um, I've never even heard of that group at all. UTFO? No. Oh, man, you're missing out. Uh, trying to think uh, a couple other ones. Uh, Down with the King, uh, oh, yeah. Run DMC is, is an amazing song. Um, they did that little remix for the DX uh, WWF yeah, that rap good. album. That yeah. yeah. Uh, and then uh, I'm trying to think of pick like favorite song of, of every group that I know. Uh, LL. Um, Rock the Bells, right? Come on. No, actually, uh, his newer. I like it. It's not new anymore, but like uh, Jingling Baby is, is probably is, is up there for LL or My Radio, the what, original. What about? Did you like when he had or his go, like Go Cut Creator Go is also a really good. Did song. you like when he had his little resurgence in the late the late nineties? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Jingling Baby was was one of those songs. Doing it and doing it and doing yeah, it around. Yeah, doing it well. <laughs> Whatever. Um, yeah, let me see. Of the female wise. Um, I mean, Latifah's good. There's actually a great mix if you want. Like back in the early '90s, they had uh, a thing where that, like, they would put like 20 people on this on one record, you know. And it's it's called uh, "Roll with the Flavor." Okay. If you ever wanna, you wanna hear Freddie Fox, aka Bumpy Knuckles, uh, cuts an amazing verse on on that song, and Latifah's good on it. Uh, what's Bumpy Knuckle? Who's what's he from? I've heard that he name. He worked for Cena. Cena shit. Okay, which also, that, which, that which is also a damn but, good song. I'm going to go on record and say 24 hours that goes hard as fuck too. Oh yeah, he's he's a ama- Freddie Fox. He's yeah. he's amazing. But Bad Man is a damn good song. I'm going to go. Bad Man. I'm going to go on record and say that right yeah, now. Freddie Fox is pissed. When uh, this is this will get off on a little bit of a tangent, but like right when Ed of you first started. Uh, and we were working with Peabody's The Concert Club. One of the guys that was involved with us, he also worked there. And we kind of had a, like, John Cena only did, I think, like three actual concerts. And one of them was in Cleveland that we kind of helped coordinate. And, uh, yeah, it was it was wild to see John Cena perform live. That's before your time in AIW, I think. Uh, no, because I, I remember, well, maybe because I remember changing upstairs and somebody making the comment. Well, yeah, that yeah, Cena that's what was there with Cena was doing his thing up there. But yeah, yeah, that's half just, of Cleveland, I think. So it was, uh, but yeah, uh, that's how I knew Bumpy Knuckles. Uh, I was like, how do I fucking know that name? Yeah, but there's just do yourself a favor, go on YouTube, look up any of the bands I mentioned or the guys I mentioned or the girls I mentioned. Listen to some of their shit. It's um, it's fucking amazing. It's so much better than this stupid crap. That you heard today. Oh, I got something to show wise. you after the podcast. Any uh, any, any final uh, comments from uh, from the peanut gallery here? Uh, before my time, but the fashion was on point in the mid eighties. That tight, is very true. In the early eighties, the tangos and the, leather pants and the parachute and the fucking, pants, and yeah, they had. Uh, I, 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 like I, the I, did, I, I did have some parachute pants back, back oh. when I was. Did you, have, <laughs> did you have the Kangol hat too? I did not have a Kangol. No. Oh my gosh! There was a store at Great Northern Mall called uh, Chess King. Some shell top Adidas. And uh, no, I did not. I did not have the untied open uh, white Adidas. Did you have a golden necklace, like a little golden chain? Like no, I just, had, I just had the. I just had the parachute pants. Earring? No, no, never had an earring. You should get an earring. Yeah, uh, I don't know. A well, that, that's that's a that's a different episode. A little it's power move. <laughs> All right. You well, get an earring. I'll get an earring. We'll figure it out. <laughs> okay. I think uh, I think this is a good first episode. I think uh, the pilot uh, may get renewed for a, a full order of uh, thirteen the episodes. Yeah. See, the in syndic- see in syndication. Yes. Lit. Fam. Uh, all right. Uh, any final words? Uh, no, man. Just like I said, just check out those people I mentioned. You guys will open your open your ears and your mind to a whole other world, and you'll thank me for it. All right. Well, uh, till next time. Take me to another place.